Good afternoon and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. I am Victoria Budson, the Executive Director of the Women in Public Policy Program. As a courtesy to our distinguished guest and our fellow audience members, if you could please turn off your cell phones and other electronic equipment, we'd be pleased. I'd like to thank our speaker, United States Senator Deborah Stabenow, for joining us today. And I'd also like to thank the Institute of Politics for co-hosting this event. In addition, the Kennedy School Democratic Caucus and the Harvard College Undergraduate Democratic Group has also co-sponsored. And it's with special pleasure that Senator Stabno joins us today, particularly to kick off our From Harvard Square to the Oval Office Forum events taking place here at the school. It's a program which we began here at the Kennedy School last year to help infuse women with the skills and training that they need to ascend in the electoral process at the local, state, and national level here in the United States. Without such interventions along the current trajectory, it will take more than 200 years for women to gain parity with men in the United States political system. Now today, our introduction will take place from Governor Jean Shaheen. She was the first woman ever to hold the position of governor in the state of New Hampshire. In addition, she was the 15th woman ever elected governor in the history of the United States from 1776 until that election. Now, Senator Stabenow is the first woman to be elected to the United States Senate from Michigan and only the 29th woman at the time of her election ever to serve in the United States Senate. I'm confident that if we follow in the example of these two women, that number will change drastically. Without further ado, let me welcome Governor Shaheen.
Thank you, Victoria. Good afternoon, everyone. As you heard, I am the former governor of New Hampshire. I'm also the current director at the Institute of Politics here at the Kennedy School. We are very pleased to be able to partner with Women in Public Policy and with the Kennedy School Democrats and the Harvard Undergraduate Democrats to bring you the program today. Now, I know that many of you in the audience, you students, are thinking about maybe running for public office someday. And for those of you thinking about that, Debbie Stabenow is a real inspiration and a role model. She won her first election to the Ingham County Board of Commissioners while she was still a graduate student, all you Kennedy School students, think about that. She became the first woman and the youngest member ever to chair that board. She's had a life of firsts and breaking barriers for women and youth her entire professional career. She served in the Michigan State House of Representatives from 1979 to 1990 and became the first woman ever to preside over the Michigan House. After two terms in the State Senate and two terms in Congress, Debbie Stabenow was elected to the United States Senate in a very tough race where she took on a Republican incumbent who outspent her two to one and called her Little Debbie. <laughs> For the Little Debbie cakes and pies? Well, let me tell you, nobody is calling her Little Debbie now. In November of 2004, Senator Stabenow was elected by her colleagues as the third highest ranking Democrat in the United States Senate. That is an unprecedented honor for a freshman senator. While she's a skilled legislator and a team player, she's not afraid to do what's right and to dissent when she thinks she should. She was one of only 23 senators to oppose authorizing President Bush to order U.S. troops into Iraq. Senator Stabenow has been a tireless fighter for children and families and working people, and no one in Congress knows prescription drugs better than Debbie Stabenow. She is truly changing the face of politics in America. Please join me in welcoming Senator Debbie Stabenow. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, what a great space. This is wonderful. I am so pleased to be able to be here with all of you, and particularly with my great friend, Jean Shaheen. We have uh, traveled together and campaigned together, and you are very lucky to have her in the position that she is in right now, and I, also know uh, my great friend, Ambassador Swanee Hunt, where is she? Uh, right in front of me, right in front of me. You are so lucky to have this wonderful woman as well. We are so grateful for all of your leadership and look forward to your continued leadership as well. And also Victoria Budson, what a great team that you have. I also know, I don't know, is Martin Frost here, my house, former House colleague who's now a fellow here, and I know that my former colleague, Senator uh, Bob Graham, is also a Kennedy Fellow, and so I know you are surrounded uh, by wonderful people, uh, many of whom I have had the good fortune to be able to work with and to know. I also know firsthand that this program trains terrific people, because I stole one of them to come and work for me. Uh, Julia Hoffman, who's here with me, wherever Julia is, uh, came from this wonderful institute to work for me. And so please keep producing wonderful people, and I'll just keep stealing them, that's all. <laughs> you know, every one of us has our own story, as I look around the room. Every one of us has the story that brought us to where we are. Every one of us remembers people along the way who have made a difference, who saw something in you that was great and encouraged you to be the best you could be. I'm here today because of the courage and the hard work and the encouragement of wonderful people, 
of wonderful women, starting with my own mother and my own father, who at a time and place when girls weren't given a lot of opportunities, told me to dream big dreams and always go as far as I could go. And I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm also standing here, though, because of women, some of whom I have known, but some I never knew. I think of Rosa Parks, our wonderful Michigan, Detroit, Michigan resident, who at the age of 92 passed away on Monday. And I think of the courage of this woman who was willing to sit down so that everybody else would be empowered to stand up. And how she changed the world because of her willingness to stand up for her own dignity and her own sense of respect. And she, this weekend, will be honored in an extraordinary way among many, many honors. But we have been able, and I'm pleased to have helped sponsor a resolution that will allow her to lie in honor at the nation's capital, the first woman to ever lie in state at the United States Capitol. It will be a very, very important moment for all of us. Now, when I walk outside my office in Washington, the Hart Office Building, I have right next door to me another very important office, and that's the headquarters of the historic National Women's Party and the home of Alice Paul, who led the courageous fight that earned all of us, all of the women in this country, the right to vote. If you have the opportunity to see the wonderful movie on HBO, The Iron-Jawed uh, Maiden, or, uh, Angels, Iron-Jawed Angels, uh, that was a story that took place right next to my office building. And I think of that always as I think about what it took to give me the right to vote, to give you the right to vote, and the opportunity to dream big dreams and run for office, and the opportunity for me to be now in the United States Senate. I also think about Margaret Chase Smith, a woman I never knew, a woman who was the first woman in our nation's history to serve in both the US House and the US Senate. And I think about the courage that she had when on June 1st, 1950, June 1st, 1950, she stood on the floor as a woman who had been just elected to the United States Senate two years before, at a time when freshmen were to be seen and not heard. Thank goodness that's changed. <laughs> she stood on the floor and stood up against Joe McCarthy. She was the first person to stand on the floor and to criticize McCarthyism. And there's a story, we recently placed her picture in the Senate, and there's a story that goes that she was riding on the Senate subway over to the Senate floor to give her speech. Joe McCarthy got on the train. He said, uh, uh, good morning, how are you? She said, I'm doing well, Senator. I'm not sure you're going to like what I have to say today. And she went to the floor, and I can tell you, at great odds, I, because I know what she was up against in standing up and saying enough was enough, and defending our right to dissent, our right to criticize, our right to speak out, our right to have opinions as Americans. And I am proud of her, Margaret Chase Smith. I could go on and on with women who have come before us, who understood and believed in themselves, who had the courage to step forward and get involved and take risks in order to get something done. And that's what I believe we should all be aspiring to. And we all benefit by not only knowing them and the doors that they opened, but by making sure that after we walk through them, they stay open which is a very important challenge, I think, today for all of us. You know, I've been involved in a lot of firsts in my life. When Governor Sheen was talking about firsts, that's the legacy of our generation. We share the fact 
that we have been involved in first. And I've always said, you know, it's great to be the first. But if you're the only, that's called a token. The challenge is to make sure there's a second, and a third, and a fourth, and that pretty soon we don't count the first anymore because we are all equally able to be involved. I know that it's important that to change the face of power, we have to have women involved in every kind of position so that you can see someone like you and say, I can be there. You know, I remember when Ann Richards, my good friend, was running for governor. They said, well, you know, she doesn't look like a governor. She looks like a grandma. Or she looked like a governor after she got elected. <laughs> Being able to see someone that looks like you in a position sends more of a message than anything else, I believe, as to whether or not you believe you can get there. I'll never forget my daughter when she was uh, about five years old. This is back when they actually pumped gas, you know, and it didn't, you have to sell the house, you didn't have to sell the house in order to buy it. My daughter wanted to be a gas station attendant and pump gas. She thought that'd be so cool. One day she comes home from kindergarten crying, and I said, what's the matter, Michelle? She says, well, I, I can't be a gas station attendant. Now, I'm in the state legislature, and I'm, honey, you can be whatever you want to be. <laughs> I said, well, why would you say that? And she said, well, I've never seen any girls do it. Hmm. So I started looking around. There weren't any women gas station attendants. And my five-year-old, whose mother was an elected official who had told her her entire five years of existence she could be whatever she wanted to be, didn't believe me because she didn't see anybody. That has stuck with me my whole life since her expression of that about the importance of being there. I've seen the university president, the CEO, the senator, the house member, the director, the president of seeing women in every position. I also remember that when I was in high school, and I don't want to say how long ago, in a small town in northern Michigan, I was extremely good in math and science, valedictorian of my high school, and I was given by my counselor three choices of what to be, a nurse, a teacher, or a social worker, all wonderful professions. But those were not the only three choices I should have been given. Today, my soon-to-be daughter-in-law has a degree and advanced degree in materials science engineering. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> she works for General Motors. She's on the management track, and she's very smart. So I have seen us come a long way. I also have seen us come a long way as it relates to the political arena. When I first ran for the County Board of Commissioners in 1974, I was five at the time. Uh, I ran against a gentleman who referred to me as that young broad. The good news is the young broad beat him. Uh, but I know now that while someone may say that, or think that, they wouldn't say that out loud, certainly, anymore. Since that first time I ran, though, I've seen so many changes in so many ways. But one of the most important things I've seen is that the year I ran for the Senate in 2000 was a real time of change for the United States Senate. In that year, in 2000, was after that, in 2001, was the first time that we had enough women in the United States Senate to have a woman on every committee. Think about that. In our history as a country, it was the first time that we had a woman on every committee. Now, just five years later, Susan Collins chairs the Homeland Security Committee. Olympia Snow chairs the Small Business Committee. And we have women speaking out on every committee. I also have seen us change the debate. You know, I, I will never forget when I came to the State House of Representatives being asked if I wanted to be on the Constitutional Revisions and Women's Rights Committee. That's where they put all the women. 
And I said, I wanted to be on the committee that affected women and men, affected everybody, taxation, judiciary, environment, public health, all the things that were uh, affecting all of us in our lives. And one of the great things that is happening now is that we are beginning, finally, to have some understanding that every issue is a woman's issue. We breathe the air and drink the water and pay the taxes and drive on the roads and uh, care about national policy and serve in the military and serve as ambassadors. And everything is a women's issue. But now that we've earned a place at the table, we've got to make sure that our voices are heard. And I believe where I sit, that's still a challenge. I'll never forget after 2001, 9-11, and the media discussion and the interviews with my colleagues on television. I never saw Senator Dianne Feinstein, who was a member of the Intelligence Committee, interviewed at that time. I bet you didn't know that Senator Mary Landrieu from Louisiana was chair of a subcommittee on emerging threats, terrorism. She never got asked what she thought about terrorism after 9-11. Senator Barbara Boxer on foreign relations. I could go on and on. I believe that we are at a point now where we need to not only make sure that the faces of power have changed, but the voices as well that we are hearing from women and women's voices. Yesterday, a group in Washington called Women Matter, which is a new web-based nonprofit group, announced a survey that they had done of 1,200 women uh, talking to them about politics and government and whether or not they felt engaged, whether or not they felt it made any difference in their lives. And overwhelmingly, the people surveyed said no. Maybe if they heard more women's voices in the debates, more women's views and experiences, they would feel more engaged. And I think that is the next challenge from where I sit. One of the things that this survey also pointed out is that the women wanted less talk and more action. And boy, I think everybody wants that. They said they didn't want to hear about sound bites, but they wanted details and they wanted us to talk about what problems there were and what solutions there were and what they could do to help make the best decisions for themselves and their families. I think it's especially important right now that women be involved in the economic debate that is going on. We all need to be involved, but we need women's voices and participation for many, many reasons. First of all, we are all equally impacted. But we have the majority of small businesses, which create the majority of jobs today, being started by women. That's something important in terms of looking at economic policy. But we also have a huge stake in what's going on in our manufacturing economy. And I want to spend just a moment on that, because when we look at the face of power in Michigan, that's a governor named Jennifer Granholm, a US senator named Debbie Stabenow. And we are deeply, deeply involved now in the whole question of where we go and how we compete in the international marketplace. And if we are going to be successful in maintaining our way of life and competing successfully in this new global marketplace. Michigan is a challenging place right now. We just had the largest bankruptcy in the history of the country with Delphi Corporation, uh, a wonderful company uh, that is making tremendous products, but has had tremendous challenges as it relates to their costs. I could go on and on with other challenges in terms of businesses in Michigan, but I would say that as we look at what is happening in Michigan, it is a sign for what will continue to happen in many places across our country if we don't act in the right way to create the right level playing field for manufacturers in our country to be able to maintain their edge and maintain our jobs and our standard of living. Senator John F. Kennedy said in 1960, 
as a senator, economic policy can result from governmental inaction as well as action. Right now, federally, we have inaction. The same thing that the women in the survey were talking about. Less talk, more action is needed. And we have inaction occurring on things that directly relate to our ability to maintain a strong economy in our country. I believe that in America, one of the great things that has driven our economy is that we make things and grow things. That's what we do in Michigan, and we do it very, very well. We make things and grow things. And there has to be an economic base there of making things and growing things, creating new ideas to create new things. But somebody has to make something. Somebody has to grow something as part of that economy. And right now, in the new international marketplace, we are not paying attention in a way that is smart for us to what the rules are for trade. Of course we have to trade, and we want to trade, but we want to make sure we are exporting our products and not our jobs. And if our trade agreements don't value human beings in the equation, or don't value the environment and other issues that relate to quality of life, then we are going to continue to see a race to the bottom, and that is of great concern to me. Right now, we have other countries that manipulate their currency or steal our patents, and we are not serious about stopping that. And yet, when we are perceived to be doing things that are against the World Trade Organization, other countries don't hesitate to bring actions against us to make sure, in their minds, that it's fair. The European Union took us to court a couple of years ago because they said we were unfairly subsidizing, through our tax code, business activity. They won. We changed our tax laws. We have to be as serious as other countries at looking at what is fair in the global marketplace for our manufacturers and for our workers. That's why I've introduced something called an international trade prosecutor that is a bipartisan effort with a colleague of mine, Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, that would place an office monitoring what is happening to make sure the playing field is level. The second thing that we've got to tackle is the question of health care. The most important issue affecting every family in Michigan, every woman in Michigan, as well as every business, large and small, is what's happening on health care for us. And it's very disturbing to me when I see the fact that we are spending more than twice as much as any other country on health care today. Twice as, more than twice as much. We spend $5,635 per person in health care, and that's as of a couple of years ago. $5,635 per capita, and the other countries around the world compared to that are $2,307. And yet we have 45 million people with no health insurance. There's something wrong with this picture. If you were to take all the money that we spend and put it up on this stage and could start over, you could cover everybody and do it in a way that I believe would save dollars if we had the political will to actually do that. There are proposals in front of us. My colleagues and I have a number of proposals to deal with funding health care, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, moving to health IT to save huge amounts of dollars in health care. It all takes political will to do it. But if we do not, we will continue to see probably the most critical cost issue for manufacturers in our country going unaddressed. And we will continue to see the pressure to move, to lose jobs, and so on. And finally, I would say, we have got to invest more greatly in education and innovation so that when we're in the international marketplace, we are competing up and not down. The strategy has to be to create that fair, level playing field for our businesses, to tackle health care, which we can do and must do, 
to make sure somebody who's worked all their life has the pension that they were promised and have paid into. But then we have to also address education and innovation. If we don't do that, and if we have a continued strategy that says, if you'll only work for less, we can be competitive, that is a lose-lose strategy for America. And I see that happening in terms of the messages that are being given right now in Michigan. Rather than thinking boldly and taking action to do those things that will maintain our standard of living as Americans, our people in Michigan are being told, if you only work for less, we can be competitive. We have a plant in western Michigan that closed down to go to Mexico, even though they had three shifts going. We're making profits, but they could make more if they moved and paid $1.50 an hour and no health benefits. That is a strategy for disaster for us in America, because who's going to buy an automobile, which I happen to care a lot about, that you all buy automobiles? Who's going to be able to do that, or buy a car, or go to college? if that's the strategy. We can do better than that. We can do better than that. And there are women on the forefront of challenging that strategy. And I am proud to be one of them. We can and must have a race up. That's what it needs to be. Our brain power, our brawn power, all that we can do to make this a continued race up new ideas, innovation, focusing on education, changing the cost where we can on health care and other issues. We must make it a race up. America cannot sustain a race down. And that right now is the number one issue, I believe, uh, fa certainly facing Michigan and one of the critical issues for America. We can do better than that. And women are leading on these issues, whether it's the state senate and state house or the boardrooms or the factories or kitchen tables. We get it, that we can do better. Everyone here today is part of a gen generation of change and challenge and opportunity. We've been blessed to witness breaking of glass ceilings, sound barriers, and tearing down walls. But there's a lot more to do. And it involves action, not just words. We can do better for America. And I believe that women must play a critical role in making things better. We also have a responsibility to continue to honor those, honor those who have come before us. Rosa Parks, Alice Paul, Margaret Trace Smith, and the thousands of other women who have made it possible for us to be here today. The doors they opened in their time must stay open in our time and your children's time. And to do that, we must follow by their example of courage and action, not just words. Together, America can do better, and we will. Thank you. Thank you. As usual in the forum, Senator Stabenow has agreed to take questions from the audience and from students. We have four microphones, two on the floor, two up on level two. And I would just ask that you all ask one question and keep it brief, end with a question mark. Yes. Hi, my name is Jama Adams. I'm a second year student at the Kennedy School. Um, the current, well, the judicial nominations have put the spotlight on the Senate's advise and consent role um, and kind of the, the longer term vision. How do you personally balance the, that, that role um, with you know, responding to the needs of your constituents in Michigan? Well, first of all, uh, the third branch of government is split in terms of the responsibility for confirmation, for selecting judges. 
Uh, our founders were pretty smart. They said half of that responsibility will be with the president and half will be with the Senate. Now, I would just note that I remember uh, studying in school that at the, the uh, original uh, debate, they started out first time and said the Senate would do it. And I, I actually like that version better. But they ended up with the president doing half and the Senate doing half. And under the Constitution, both halves are very, very important. So I think it's absolutely critical that we have individuals that are not only intellectually competent, but share a philosophy that represents the protection of our basic civil rights, our freedoms, and uh, a philosophy that is not based on one ideology here or here, in terms of something a rigid ideology, but someone who is, understands our freedoms under the Constitution and what is necessary in terms of protecting our freedoms, our right to privacy, our freedoms uh, uh, in a number of, of ways. Uh, so I consider part of uh, representing my constituents to make sure that we have the right people, ultimately, that will judge on decisions that affect their lives. We don't think about the courts that much in terms of the impact on our lives, but, but ultimately, the courts decide on issues of, of freedom and uh, justice and opportunity and uh, decide critical issues every single day that affect your ability to m move around or to speak or to have opportunities. And so that's an, a very important part of the job that I have. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Cecilia. And, hi, uh, Cecilia. Hi. I'm with the LaRouche Political Action Committee, mm -hmm. and uh, we were in Congress about two weeks ago um, with some union leaders that we had organized from the Women's Steelworkers Union, mm -hmm. as well as from the United Auto Workers. And we had several meetings with different offices, including yours. And um, as a direct result of that, we had Hillary Clinton um, call for a summit in order right. to save the machine tool sector right. of the United States. And I was gonna ask you if you were willing to work with her and us on um, you know, saving the machine tool sector of this nation, because that's the heart of a modern economy. Um, and you know, we, we need this kind of stuff to rebuild the Gulf Coast and we can retool it like we did during World War II. Absolutely, I'm part of that effort, calling for uh, a summit on manufacturing broadly. Uh, I also think that when we talk about manufacturing now, it's important to talk about high-tech manufacturing. The man manufacturing economy has changed in a positive way, uh, and our workers' skills have changed as a result of that. When you walk into uh, an auto plant now, it's not loud and dirty and, and you know, it, as it was at one time. With It's clean, it's computerized, it's quiet. There are skylights in, in some of the plants, and it's, I mean, it's a very open kind of situation. People are, are very skilled, and um, uh, it, we are seeing a high-tech manufacturing economy, not just with automobiles, whether it's automobiles, whether it's furniture, uh, whether, I mean, any computers, anything else. Uh, so it certainly involves education, innovation, but our manufacturing economy has changed and will continue to change, as it should, but we have to have it. The basis of an economy is having manufacturing, the ability, as I said before, to make things. And even as it changes with technology, as all of our lives have changed with technology, uh, we can't just say, well, gee, I guess we won't have manufacturing anymore in America. That's, that's a prescription for disaster, as far as I'm concerned. We have to, of course, change. Uh, our workers uh, are, are the first to have changed and, and been skilled and so on and so on. Yes, Thank you. Um, Senator, my name is Dimitris Valatsas. I am a freshman at the college here. I'm from Europe. Okay. Uh, the question I have for you is the following. We have seen uh, the women's issue as a social issue mainly, uh, social friction within American and the world society. Don't you believe that it's time to move away from programs and groups such as women in public policy or women in business because, and move to the next level? We don't have any groups named men in politics or men in business. It's Why called the United we? States Senate.
Um, yes. Uh, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you think that it would be? No, I, under more, I understand okay. what you're saying. I also know that part of creating opportunity for people is to, is to give them information. The, the institute, for instance. I mean, this is a, these are very important, important forums to have a chance to talk about um, opportunities and being able to take the next step and so on. I mean, we, we are not yet, I guess when we are 50 uh, men and 50 women in the U.S. Senate and we, when we have uh, people involved, women involved in every level of both government and the private sector and so on, I think those things will go away by themselves. But the reality is that uh, we need to be able to provide support and encouragement and skills and knowledge and, and uh, create opportunities. And I think that's part of why we have more women in office, frankly. I don't think it's not an accident. I mean, it's just, it didn't just happen that we have more women in office. It happened because of a conscious strategy to encourage women and to give them the, the, the skills and the knowledge and the confidence to do Thank you. that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Senator. My name is Joyce Sang. I'm a freshman at the college. And so from of, Michigan. From you need Michigan, to say, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, sort of as follow up, um, in light of all the great advances we've made, I mean, we've only been able to vote since 1920. There's, there still seem to be many steps that need to be taken in order for women to be um, on par with men um, in their practical sense, in uh, the Senate, everything. Um, and since politics has been an, an area traditionally dominated by men, and even in schools, many girls will say, oh, it's politics, that's what guys are interested in, we're not interested in that. What um, policies do you think need to be implemented <clears throat> in the educational level, maybe early education, to change this perception that people have? Well, I hope it's being changed by having uh, more women involved. And part of what we have to do is make it real, I think, for women. I think that um, the Women Matters group uh, talked about the fact that women didn't think politics had anything to do with their lives. And part of that is making sure that decisions that are made in government actually improve women's lives so that it's relevant. Uh, when folks are running around, women are juggling, you know, 10 different things and, and uh, trying to make sure they get the kids to school and get to work or get, do the other things they're doing and, and running every which way. Uh, the government needs to be supportive and part of uh, creating more time for women, creating opportunities and economic security, uh, the opportunities for those things. So I think, I think we are seeing more women being involved, but in order to continue that, women have to th see the government as relevant to them. And, and that's a challenge for all of us, I think, that are, that are involved in government as well. Uh, and we continue, we move forward, but yet we move back. I mean, it's a, it's a continual struggle. Uh, I think of uh, Title IX, which was really one of the most historic uh, pieces of legislation to create opportunity for women uh, that is ever passed. I'm not sure there is anything else other than the right to vote that has had the impact of Title IX to create uh, the ability for you to go to college, to get into law school and medical school, and as well as play sports and so on. You would think that this would be something overwhelmingly celebrated and we would never have to worry about it. But uh, a couple of years ago, uh, this administration started talking about creating some limits on Title IX. And the women of the Senate had to all stand up together and very loudly say no to that. So we're still, <laughs> we're still working to make sure we, we keep those opportunities in place. Yes. Hi, I'm Sunny Gettinger. I'm a second year master's in public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I know there was an <laughs> earlier question about women in the courts, but I'm curious about a specific woman in the courts, um, Harriet Myers, and what her withdrawal means, and whether you think the president will name another woman and if so, will she actually be, how conservative can we expect this next nominee to be? Well, um, I don't think my recommendations are going to be the ones that they're <laughs> going to take. Uh, I, whoops, I wish. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know who, who we can, we can, uh, we can guess right now. Um, I think that given the fact that there was such a strong outcry from uh, the most conservative right-wing part of 
uh, the party, the Republican Party, that they wanted somebody else that they felt was more tried and true and had, uh, had more of a paper trail on their positions and so on. My assumption is that it will be someone more that fits into that category, that would be viewed as much more uh, radical to the right. Uh, whether that's a woman or not, I don't know. I would assume that there would be great pressure to nominate another woman. I think just in general, it'd be unfortunate to uh, see a woman have, uh, removed from that process and replaced by a man just in general. But I also think, in this case, philosophy uh, and values uh, are the most important thing. Yeah, so we'll have to wait and see. One of the things that I was concerned about in the whole process with Harriet Myers uh, is just to make sure that she was, in fact, treated fairly, whether or not I would support her or not. Um, I wanted to make sure that she was uh, not being asked different things than a man would be asked or be held to some other kind of standard uh, than any of the other uh, uh, males that would come before us. And so I had watched for that, but I think there were a whole range of issues involved with that nomination, and we'll have to see what comes next. But I think for those of us who are very concerned about the court moving, uh, in a, a radical direction, uh, I would assume that we would probably be very concerned about the next nominee. Yes. Hi, my name is Sherry Orbach. I'm Hi. a first year master's in public policy student. Hi. It was very refreshing to hear a legislator talk about substantive ideas on how to improve the economy for low income and middle income workers. I'm wondering how you rally public support behind those ideas and distinguish your platform from those of other legislators who only give lip service to economic justice when the media seems to only tolerate sound bites. Well, <clears throat> in terms of sound bites, that's a constant challenge for us today, I think. Um, and I think that's part of what turns a lot of women off that they, it seems like it's a sound bite or it's just the ads or whatever, and we're not having some kind of substantive debate. Although it's hard to find those arenas. This is a wonderful arena to do that. But most women also, uh, by the way, are just working so hard all the time that they usually are the last ones to decide, many women, on how they're going to vote. And they, they focus the last couple of weeks because they're so busy. And like most women, they'll do it when they have to. You know, you have to go in order when, you're, when you've got deadlines to meet and so on. So getting people's attention, I think, is, a, is an issue in a world where people are overwhelmed with just trying to make it most people. Uh, in terms of the agenda, I mean, I, am, uh, I have a very specific jobs agenda that, that ad deals with issues of uh, smart trade, you know, d having fair trade for Americans as well in an international economy, health care, uh, making sure people's pensions are saved, and then investing in education and innovation. My co many colleagues agree with me on this. Unfortunately, we are not in the majority at the moment. We are not the majority of, in the House or the Senate or the White House. Um, it's going to take some change there, I think, to get that agenda at the forefront. But I'm very hopeful that between people who are affected now, more and more people being affected by what I view as failed economic policies, and those businesses who are here in America and want to be in America and are struggling under failed economic policies, if we can get those two forces together, we can make change happen. And that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you. Yes. Um, my name is Fiona Gregg, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Oh. And I wondered how you felt about um, more aggressive policies that other countries have taken towards increasing female participation in the political arena, you know, such as quota systems at the party or the state <clears throat> level, and what your view is towards those policies if they have a place in any vein here in the U.S.? Well, I think that as we are seeing new uh, governments develop, that having some expectation, uh, if it's called a quota, I think may be the way that you get women in the door at, at the beginning. And um, I don't know, I mean, I think for us, you know, I don't, I don't think there would be a willingness here in America to do something like that. And I think we have women in most places now in the door, and we have strategies to, to get more women in and that we need to be working on. But when I think of Afghanistan, for instance, or Iraq, and after uh, the uh, initial military action in Afghanistan, when there was an effort, our country, our government, was putting together an interim government 
there was a, a briefing for senators, and there was a comment made by a high-ranking official uh, when asked uh, about whether or not women would be in the interim government, and they said they would try. And I can tell you that it was the women in that room, Democrats and Republicans, who uh, said, wrong answer. <laughs> There, you know, if you expect our support, there will be women in the interim government. And there were. And I honestly don't believe that would have happened to the extent that it did if we had not been there saying, if you want our support, there will be women in the interim government. Uh, and the same is true in Iraq, which are very difficult places for women right now. And I, I think that in many ways it's been made worse. But we have, I think, played a very important role, and I think the women in the House and the Senate, particularly in the Senate, because of our responsibilities around uh, certain foreign policy issues, we have a very important role to play in saying we will not support policies that create governments or situations in other countries where women are not at the, at the governing table. Hi, I'm Brian Amia. I'm a law Hi. and policy student here from okay. Flint, Michigan. Flint, Michigan, <laughs> all right. And I'm curious to hear your opinion about the probability of the United States electing a female president in 2008. Well, I, it's going to happen. Whether it happens in 208, whoops, whether it happens in 208, um, I, I think it'd be fantastic if it did. But it's definitely going to happen. I, I know that. Yeah. Good afternoon, Senator. My name is Mamie Marcus. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm a woman interested in running for elected office. Great. And I wanted to know what you see as the biggest obstacles to women interested to running for office and to getting elected, and then once elected, what are those obstacles that keep us from getting our voices heard, and any advice you can offer to get us over those hurdles? The first thing is you have to believe in yourself and be willing to put yourself out there. Um, uh, I remember back when I was first uh, running of hearing people talk about how uh, uh, men, uh, w before and now, will decide, I'm going to run. I'm going to run for office. Will you support me? And women tend to wait to be asked. Certainly at the time I was first getting involved. It, it was always somehow, um, it was viewed as too bold or too big an ego to say, I want to run. It, but it was more comforting if you could say, I was encouraged to run by people. So. One thing is, be willing to stand up and say, I want to run, and be willing to put yourself out there. Um, and, and have confidence in yourself, and be willing to lose. I mean, be willing to take a risk. Uh, because, uh, you know, I have won every election but one. And when I, got, when I lost that, I got back up, and two years later, was successful in running for the United States uh, House of Representatives. And it's not fun. It's a whole lot more fun to win, I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, if you are willing, you know, to have enough confidence in yourself and step out and be willing to lose, it, you, you have more confidence and you can be bolder, I think, in, in what you do. Um, running for office is very much, in some ways, is very common sense in that it's about uh, your knowing why you want to run and being able to say that to somebody and then having the money to be able to communicate that to somebody so that you can, and the resources of, of people and so on, to be able to con convince them that you've got ideas and that you've got confidence and that, uh, that they should support you. And so I think it, it first starts inside. And then, and then it goes out with getting the right people, and there are plenty of people around now with great expertise, as well as fundraising organizations and so on. Uh, I think then, after being elected, it's still very much about having confidence uh, because in very subtle ways uh, we are told as women uh, really to, to wait, wait your turn. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting, when I first ran for the State House as a young woman, I was, um, uh, I had a couple of male colleagues actually who were a couple years even younger than me, but they were young and upcoming. I was young. Very subtle difference. But, and they were embraced. They, were, they had a mentor. They were embraced. I had to figure it out for myself. 
So part of what is great today and, and wonderful about what all of you are doing is to be able to embrace you and, and uh, other uh, women in the program and to have mentors. I mean, I really didn't. It was, it was kind of hit or miss as I went along trying to figure it out. And now there are wonderful ways uh, to provide mentors. And I think you need to look for a mentor, look for somebody who can help you figure things out as you go. Thank you. We have time for about three more questions. So I'll go to you and to you and then back to the gentleman there. OK. Yes. My name is Sophie, and I'm a sophomore at the college, and I'm from Farmington Hills, Michigan. Hey, all yeah. right. <laughs> and um, I was wondering, clearly you're a highly motivated person, and you have a lot of ideas and strategies for all kinds of things, like economics or healthcare. But I was wondering if there has been one really, really motivating factor for you that you kind of ha held with you during all your elections and all the things that you work on. One issue you're thinking of? A of anything, like a motivating factor or an issue that right. means a lot to you? Uh, since I started, healthcare has been a re real passion for me. In fact, I got into politics because I was part of a, of a uh, women's group that fought to keep nursing home open in my community, in Lansing, Michigan. Uh, the county wanted to close the nursing home, and it was the only one that took Medicaid for low-income seniors. And uh, my mother was a nurse and had been involved in health care, and I was very interested in health care growing up. So I got involved in that fight. And uh, in fact, the person who was trying to close the nursing home happened to be my county commissioner. And so then every, we saved the nursing home, passed a millage to build a new one, and then they turned to me and told me, you had to run against this guy. <laughs> And that's how, I ha that's how I got into politics. So ever since then. But what I have seen is um, an unwillingness to really address the fundamentals about what is wrong with American health care, which starts with the way we finance it. Again, we spend twice as much as in the other country. We do it in a crazy way where if somebody's uninsured, they walk into an emergency room, they get the health care they need as they should, and then the hospital turns around and raises the rates of everybody with insurance to pay for it. So then the insurance rates go up, and businesses drop insurance, so they are more in, uninsured, and then they walk into the nursing home, or the emergency room, and, they, and it just goes like this. So we pay more than anybody else, and we are not solving the problem here, and more and more people are uninsured. It's a crazy, crazy thing. So, uh, and it's fixable. That's the amazing thing. It is totally, totally fixable. Um, so I'm very passionate about that. And, and that is really a driving force for me. Uh, you mentioned a uh, business in Michigan. And I'm Robbie Griffin. I'm a freshman at the college. I was Hi. born in Detroit oh. and have lived here for most of my life. Oh, great. Um, but you mentioned a business that moved down to Mexico where they could go for 150 an hour and no health care benefits. How do you propose the government, what do you propose the government should do to fix this problem, both in Michigan and in the US? Well, first of all, when it comes to uh, the trade agreement, uh, NAFTA, as an example, NAFTA is an interesting situation. When we trade with Canada, very close to us in Michigan, uh, the wages are similar, environmental standards are similar, uh, they have, they have their less cost healthcare system. That's why we have manufacturers moving to Canada, by the way, because of the healthcare system and the cost of the healthcare system. But we can trade back and forth fine. When you move then to the South with a country with an entirely different system of, of, of standard of living, wages, uh, and so on, and which, by the way, have gone down under NAFTA, not up, uh, it creates a different kind of economic pressure. And that's why there were many people who believed that the trade agreement should be clear that there would be workers' rights built into it, not just uh, important issues for corporations but that environmental standards and the ability for workers to organize, collectively bargain, to bring up wages, to deal with safety issues and all those things, that that was an important part of creating a level playing field to trade. Those things were not included. So you have a situation where there's not a level playing field and there's not the ability for workers to really increase their standard of living. 
Uh, there's not the commitment on the environment to do what is needed. So the pressure then is all on us to compete down to them. So it starts with trade agreements that work. And then it, from there, it starts with enforcing trade agreements and in, in situations where our patents are stolen. I'll give you one example. Another a gentleman who is in wood, wood manufacturer in Michigan made this product for $70. He, uh, after it was on the market a couple of weeks, a Chinese company came in and made it for under $10. Stole the whole thing, including the instructions and the packaging. Um, and he, and it was illegal. He took them to international court and where the Chinese government, the Chinese company are there together and he's there by himself. That's why I've created the proposal for an international trade prosecutor to stand with our American company. You know, and we certainly, I mean, China is a major market for us. We certainly want to be trading and doing business with them, but it's illegal to do that. And we need to call folks on it, just as they make sure that we are not violating trade laws. And if we don't, we continue to just see this, this spiral going on. And so I think it has to start with that. And then we have to deal with our own cost structure, which is health care and other issues. And we've got to make sure we're competing up. Because other countries aren't just competing with low-wage jobs. They're putting a lot of money into education and innovation. And we've got to make sure we are competing in those areas as well. Yes, final question. Uh, I just want to, I've got to gather my thoughts. I get nervous at this stuff. <clears throat> That's OK. Um, I just want to thank you, Senator, for coming today and having us. Uh, my name is Jimmy Sharp. I've been, I'm with the LaRouche Political Action Committee also. I've been organizing in Michigan this past year. Really? And, um, and, and kind of coupled with what this guy said, as uh, Governor Granholm brought up this week, CAFTA, NAFTA have been giving us the SHAFTA. In the name of uh, globalization or globalization uh, and free trade, LaRouche has called for an emergency action by the Senate. And so actually this past year, come to think of it, Stephanie Tubbs-Jones, Barbara Boxer, yourself, and you were pretty concise when, when saying fair trade is where we need to go. Um, isn't it time for that emergency action by the Senate to save the auto industry in terms of uh, this proposal actually being passed in 13 states that LaRouche has called for, including uh, um, Lamar Lemons introducing it in the state legislature. Um, and this idea of a trade prosecutor, for example, to, to have a science driver towards actual economic development. What I mean by that, expandable highways, maglev trains, and follow up, what is the obstacle, isn't it, that we need to also draft impeachment proceedings for Dick Cheney? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, let me speak to trade. <laughs> um, let me just say that the, I mean, I absolutely believe that what's happening right now in Michigan uh, is a wake-up call across the country. And it's happening, it's happening in the textile industry, uh, it's happening in other places, but it is a wake-up call for a failed set of policies. Now, I am not suggesting we put a wall around the United States. It wouldn't work anyway. Where the internet would jump any wall. My cell phone would jump any wall. That is not what this is about. That's what the other side says. The other side says it's protectionism or it's step back and whatever happens, happens. That doesn't work, stepping back. When, it may work for, the, for the, the global businesses, the international businesses. It doesn't work for America. It doesn't work for Americans. There's, a, there's a, a middle point here. Fair trade. Sometimes I say smart trade. Let's just be smart about it. You know, well, of course we want the markets. Of course we are in an international marketplace. But does that mean we're going to voluntarily give up our standard of living in this country? You know, I, it, it makes no sense. I mean, I, I welcome going to other uh, the countries with poor environmental standards where you can't drink the water. I don't want to live there. I, I want to help them create good environmental standards. I want to help them raise their standard of living. That's what we ought to be about. Trade ought to be about raising the standard of living of other countries so they can share in the economic prosperity in the world, not saying to us, if you'll work for buck fifty, no health benefits, we'll stay in America. That is wrong. 
and, we, and it's time to stand up and say it is wrong. And we're going to put in place policies that both help, but also say it's wrong. We actually have a Massachusetts legislator right. with us, so we want to <laughs> give her the opportunity oh, yes. to ask her. Thank question. you. I really wasn't going to ask a question. I'm Ann Paulson. I'm a state rep in uh, Massachusetts. Hi. I was just going to indicate to you okay. that there are a number of members of the Massachusetts House of Representatives here today uh, okay. to listen to you. We are delighted. Barbara Latalian is sitting over there from Andover. Hi. And, uh, um, Kay Khan from uh, Newton and Alice Peisch uh, from Great. Wellesley, and we also have Betty Tamor, who started the Women in Public Policy and Politics program at BC, and it's Excellent. now at the University of Massachusetts, and in Massachusetts, we do have a caucus of women legislators that's led by Erica Madison, who is our new executive director. So we're very pleased to hear you. We're so happy to hear someone of like mind. <laughs> and uh, uh, we, uh, of course, look forward to working uh, with the federal government, because just as a last word, I would say that, uh, of course, the federal government is leaving, really leaving the states behind. And uh, it is very difficult for Excellent. us to uh, have proper um, help for the poor people of Massachusetts and uh, finding housing and so forth when the federal government is leaving all of the states in the lurch. So I know it's not your fault, uh, but uh, we really do need to make some changes so that uh, we do have better policies that really speak to supporting all of the people uh, in Massachusetts and in the country. Thank no you. No question. Together, America can do better, <laughs> and we will. Thank you all. Thank you.